definitions, uh, and we talk about yesterday what's the definition of hybrid, and it means several things depend uh, where you are. So, uh, but again, the purpose of it, it was just to uh, prepare uh, our faculty, have this opportunity for them to build this uh, common understanding for teaching effectiveness, of course, for creating this opportunity to create this uh, common understanding, of course, of what the uh, what hybrid means, and of course, providing knowledge and skills to teach in the online face-to-face -face environment, which is which is the hybrid modality. Um, I had mentioned that we always um, there for the faculty, um, but also in this particular training. We want to make sure that the students were benefited uh, at the end of this, uh, uh, after the implementation of this uh, of this training. Um, so we had also that in mind um, when we were preparing this faculty training or this faculty professional development. Um, so after 2020, when everybody went online, in it was summer 2021, um, when we were just planning to come back and go back to normal and whatever the new normal was. Um, so there was a, a need, there was a need uh, from faculty, there was a need from students because they were missing that face-to-face -face engagement, that face-to-face -face interaction. Um, so having some limitations when we said going back to normal um, or administration wanted to do some uh, uh, hybrid courses. Again, having the online components something that the faculty had learned from the past, from the pandemic, um, but adding that face-to-face -face component, that face-to-face -face interaction that they were missing uh, in the previous year. So meeting with the student success, um, we did a several of um, surveys for students. And of course it came out that that was, that was the missing part. Of course, students being students and wanted to have that interaction with, uh, with classmates, right? either in the classroom or outside the classroom, but within campus. So again, that was the origin of, the, uh, of, this, uh, of this training. Um, once we prepared the trainings, there were some of the expectations um, that there was mentioned for the faculty. Uh, we wanna make sure that the faculty attended these sessions, every single session, not skip anyone, because they will be a one week uh, training. So it will be kind of intensive for the faculty. So they will have a, a, an option to, or space to reflect. It was not only application, but also to reflect in terms of uh, the topics that they will be uh, teaching. They have to have some type of activities. And then the first, uh, the first days of the training, they have to start working on that. So application was also embedded on it. And of course, we want for the, uh, for the faculty to share with, uh, with peers, right? Want to make sure that the, uh, um, there was this, uh, learning of uh, um, learning community where they can uh, they can share uh, what they were doing as they go through the training. Um, it's kind of small there, but uh, uh, some of the uh, some of the um, student engagement uh, and hybrid classroom uh, activities, of course, were in terms of uh, defining hybrid, um, identifying the learning objectives of the course before even touching technology, before even going any, any deeper, they have to have learning outcomes. So student learning outcomes ready. Uh, of course, they have to have a, um, they have to provide feedback in terms of assessments and, and, and things like that activities. Uh, learn best practices, of course, for the student engagement and share some student engagement activities, as I mentioned, uh, with peers. Um, some of the things that we had considered is, of course, having this equity-minded approach, right, for the students' engagement. Uh, of course, focusing on minorities, focus, focusing on um, st students with the special needs. Uh, we had to have that in mind as a faculty in terms of um, designing and delivering content, either online or face-to-face. -face. Some other um, aspects were introduced uh, besides hybrid, which is high flex. Uh, some of us are familiar with that, in which the um, the students will have the option either to take it to take the course face to face or online. So some of those concepts was, were also uh, discussed during the training. 
Um, again, this was a, a one week session, two hours per week. Uh, and of course we start on, on day one with definitions of uh, what hybrid is for UTRGV. And of course, uh, some of the approaches in terms of uh, hybrid, high flex, and, and best practices for it. Then, right, two minutes. Um, learning objectives, of course, like mentioned in the past, uh, feedback assessment, make sure that they have those uh, ready. Uh, best practices for student engagement, it was the key of this professional development. And of course, like I mentioned, sharing, sharing content. Some of the technologies were introduced, uh, Blackboard being the, the bread uh, and butter of, uh, of technologies. Uh, Jamboard, Netport, and Miro, they, those also were integrated because remember we were talking about the student engagement. So those were also um, implemented during the process. Some of the accomplished or highlights here since I got uh, just a couple of minutes to work on it. Of course, we had the, the opportunity to provide uh, critical reflections uh, of, of the practice, um, provide opportunities for the dialogue, um, faculty talking to faculty, uh, sharing their experience, uh, of course, having these uh, incorporating digital tools in their hybrid, in the hybrid courses, and of course, provide best practices for the student engagement in, in the hybrid classroom. So those were like the main, the main concepts that they were offered or they were taught into the, uh, into the, uh, into the professional development that, that, um, that we develop. After the first session, of course, we uh, incorporate high impact to, to implement practices. Uh, to those uh, who, like those faculty who put those um, work in, on place. Um, and as I mentioned, teachers wanted to learn from teachers or peers want to learn from peers. So that's something that uh, we also include. Um, we invite faculty to participate into our, our trainings. It was not only the instructional designers um, teaching faculty or, or sharing information with faculty, but it was uh, other, other faculty members um, sharing that uh, information with them. So at the end, we came up with these resources that it was open to all faculty at the university. We create this website with all, um, with videos, uh, examples and, and uh, other, other um, materials. Again, to those who were uh, available for, for other faculty who were not able to attend the training, but they have those materials uh, available. And I think I, um, I can conclude the presentation there if, um, if I'm running out of, out of time, but uh, I have a page with some resources. I'm willing to share this information with you. All right. Thank you so much. <laughs> Just in time. Our not, uh, next presenter is Dr. Deust. She is presenting virtually through the, the Zoom channel. And you'll be able to see her on our screen. Good morning, can you hear me okay? Good morning, are you able to hear me? Yes, we're able to hear you. We're working on being able to see you. Okay. <laughs> oh, there we go. Now we can see you. Perfect, good morning. I just wanna thank Hetz for, for having me this morning. Um, and for recognizing our presentation and also for being accommodating to the virtual setting. Uh, as I pull up my PowerPoint here, I'll just introduce myself. My name is Dr. Amanda Just. For the past um, 10 years, I've been working in higher education on grants. And then before that, in my previous life, I actually worked um, at a high school working with students who were at risk. So I have a history of working with uh, different populations of students and really trying to get them to succeed. So currently I am the director of the Graduate Student Research Center at Albizu University, the Miami campus, um, which is a small private university. Um, and we primarily have graduate students. That's our primary target audience. And I started in January of 2020 uh, so three months on campus before we went virtual in the pandemic. So what was identified to us during that time, the very short time that I got to meet with the program directors, is that there was a definite need um, for these graduate students, specifically the ones that have to write dissertations in their writing, their grammar, and really getting this thing done, <laughs> right? 
Uh, so we have two different programs that are doctoral programs at our university. We have a clinical psychology doctoral program and they write what is called a doctoral project, which is very similar to a dissertation. And then we have a human services program, which is a PhD program, and they write a traditional um, dissertation. So I don't wanna give away our full presentation because my colleague, the director of the Title V grant, um, and I will be presenting right after this. So I'll give you a little bit of the cliff note version and I hope that you come and join us. Are you able to see my screen? Yes, we're able to see the screen. Perfect. It's, it's not in presentation mode though. Uh, okay, that's okay. <laughs> okay. It'll be easier for me to kind of jump around that way. No problem. Um, so, like I said, I met with the program directors. Uh, we were really trying to accommodate to this online format and the main challenges that they found in our student body in the, the ones that are writing either a doctoral project or dissertation, um, found that most of our students were English as second language learners. They were really struggling with summarizing information. They had a lot of trouble with grammar and then the paper organization. So here we are online in a new environment, trying to figure out what to do. So this presentation and what we put together is the strategies that we really took to make sure that we could pilot test something, figure out how we can help these students and then implement that into both of those programs. So our first um, student, we'll call student A, um, was a PhD candidate in human services that was long overdue for graduating and really just needed someone to help her with her dissertation. So I initially met with her via Zoom um, and we had a total of eight tutoring sessions and we covered a variety of topics. We started with her chapter one, moved on to chapter two, then we moved on to help her with the IRB so she could collect her research. And then I actually went on to help her with working on the colloquium, which I think some people also call proposal presentation to deliver to her committee. And the outcome of that pilot student um, is actually what helped us to develop a process for working one-on-one -on -one with students who are completing dissertations or doctoral projects when we can't meet face-to-face. -face. We can't see the paper, what do we have to do? So this is the initial process that we came up with, is that we hold a preliminary meeting with the student to identify the main challenges. I read um, somewhere one time that said that when you meet with a student who's having severe writing challenges, you should perform what they call triage, which is you try to identify the main areas that they're having trouble with rather than all of these little problems, grammatical errors, APA errors that they were having. So that's the goal of that first meeting is the triage. What do we really need to work on here? Um, then after that, the student sends an initial draft for review. Um, and then from that review, then they give detailed feedback. However, I do wanna point out that this detailed feedback isn't just, oh, I'm going to revise your paper for you, but instead is actually giving feedback for the student, what things that they can think about, things they can brainstorm. Did you consider adding this topic here? Um, how did you get from this transition to this transition? What was your thought process there? So that was the type of feedback that was provided. Then once the paper was sent back with feedback, we would meet via Zoom again and then discuss that feedback and really kind of get to the nitty gritty of what needs to be changed, what needs to be added and what the direction of the overall paper needed to be. And then what we did is created a survey monkey um, survey. And on that, we put an interface together that allowed us to have detailed notes of each section, each, se each session. And that really helped us because then online we have recorded when did we meet with this student? Um, what time? What was the last date that you met with this student? What were the primary challenges? Um, so that made it really easy when you were meeting with the student again, you could go back and review those notes that you had written from the previous session. And then if we needed to follow up, uh, schedule a follow up, we would do that next. And the other outcome of the pilot was that we found that there was a deficit in knowledge of the IRB in the student body. Um, so that we actually created an additional website that was developed and piloted 
for incoming PhD students. Now, I know I only have a couple more minutes, so I wanted to kind of discuss the outcomes. So our preliminary findings after we finally started getting the ball rolling after we met with this initial pilot student, we started meeting with a lot of students and duplicating this process with them. So our findings from that is that 21 students from both programs combined attended one-on-one -on -one sessions with our tutors and a total of 67 one-on-one -on -one tutoring sessions were conducted, which is a, on average about three sessions per student. And the student A graduated this past December, 2021, which was a huge accomplishment. Also, we had um, other preliminary findings is that the students were very satisfied with the, with the help they were getting from the Graduate Student Research Center. They actually voted us the most useful campus resource in the fall of 2021. And students gave testimonials that they felt more organized they had a sense of direction and they felt less overwhelmed. A lot of them also said they wish they would have the services sooner. Um, so we kind of took that to try to be targeting students as soon as they're entering these doctoral programs to get them starting to think about their dissertation or doctoral project. We also had some great feedback from the program directors that said that they really noted changes in the dissertations um, and they're much easier to read through and provide meaningful feedback. Um, so that kind of concludes, like I said, I hope that you all can come to our presentation after this where I get more into detail about all of the different technologies that we used and how we implemented those with the students. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Joost. Um, basically, when we look at these three presentations, we might have the notion that the presentations are different in and of, uh, in and of themselves. They cover different topics, but they certainly have common grounds that we definitely have to look at. Um, as Hispanic learners and Hispanic professionals, we've had all to deal with concepts such as breaking the glass ceiling, leveling the playing field, acculturation, and all of these ideas that require us Hispanics to fit in. Uh, many people have actually paved the way for us and the job that we're doing but what these presentations are suggesting is that there's a lot still to be done. There's a lot that needs to be done. And through HETS and other organizations, we can uh, work precisely for the benefit of our Hispanic learners and Hispanic uh, professionals. But I do not want to consume the rest of the time. I actually want to have the opportunity to ask our panelists some questions and give you the break in the opportunity to ask them some questions. And um, jumping in with uh, our Latinas in STEM, this was a, a, a very good proposal, but what comes next? What's your next step? We, we actually want to see where, you, where, where you're moving and where you're going. Well, my next step, everything happened during the pandemic. So the meetings have taken a little bit longer, but I am gonna continue meeting with the rest of the organization. So next step is uh, working. One of the coordinators asked me to work as a group lead for the Gen Cybersecurity girls that come to our campus uh, the week of June 22nd for a whole week. And I'll have more of a voice to get to those uh, my target audience and because I will be able to just add any type of for the courses that we, we put together for that week, mm -hmm. I'll be able to do that. So as far as, uh, in, in addition to that, the other groups that I talk to, they want to me to present oh, good. Uh, the similar topic and see if we can get a community within those organizations to get something started. Uh, they all thought it was a great idea and they needed someone or they wanted to see someone uh, talk about this. That's great. That's <laughs> great. Um, another thing that I wanted to highlight is that these issues that we're talking about are not provoked by the pandemic. This, this, this didn't happen because of a pandemic. Um, the issues with Hispanics, uh, with Latinos in general, with women in general, have, have, have been happening for, for many, many years. We're just working with them right now, uh, together with those who have you know, worked be before us to make sure that things are, are getting done. Mm -hmm. But we're, we're involved in the process. And there is another process that I actually wanted to talk, uh, uh, to talk about because as, as professors, faculty members, 
we know how difficult it might be for um, English language learners to delve into the process of, of learning. Um, and uh, both Dr. Deust and uh, Professor Garcia worked with this, with this notion. In one respect, we're talking about um, giving faculty members tools that they need to make sure that students engage. And in the other notion, we're, we're actually helping these students produce and write in a language that is not their own. But I actually wanted to ask you what happens, because we're looking at how, how to make sure that students engage. My question is, how do you make sure that faculty engage? And uh, uh, because it's, it's not easy. You were saying that you had to convince a lot of people because of the pandemic. Many of them were, were not technologically savvy. How, 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 did the, how did you make sure that they engaged before helping students engage? Yeah, there's, as, as I mentioned at UTRGV, we got policies in place, right? There was a must when the faculty have to go through specific training, specific professional development, if they want to teach online. Of course, the problem was those two were not wanting to teach online or not wanting to use technology. Uh, but something that we found through all these processes is that faculty want to learn from faculty. Mm. So inviting faculty savvy, faculty uh, early adopters and, and, and all of those type of faculty who wanted to um, innovate in every single day, uh, invited them to share um, their experience with those who are not involved on it. Of course, the pandemic came and, and they were forced to, right? Uh, but, but bringing those faculty on board and, and being part of our team, uh, we call them, uh, our office is called the Center for Online Learning and Teaching Technology, but everybody at the uh, university, they know the department as cult. Mm. So we call those faculty cultists oh. who, are, who are the, um, the champions, faculty champions. They are the ones who lead everything uh, in terms of innovation, talking with peers and all of that. Of course, we use food. Well, we pay some stipends here and there all and like all food. of those things. So. Um, but mainly faculty, hearing from faculty, is what has been working for us a lot. That's great. That's great. And uh, Dr. Joost, um, I think that it's, it's, well, writing a dissertation is impossible pretty much for everybody in and of itself. And those of us who have worked on a dissertation or, or who are working currently on a dissertation know that this is, it's time consuming, it's tiring. But when you're writing a dissertation in a language that is not your own, it adds like a, another Jumanji level. Um, now I'm wondering, because I mean, it's a fact. When we are working on translating our knowledge from one language or mother tongue to the other, we need to know the rules of our language before we start applying them to the next language. I mean, if we don't know how to write, in my case, if I don't know how to write in Spanish, Translating and moving into writing in English might be difficult. Is this project translatable? And what I mean is, can we take your project and say, use it to help Spanish speaking students or students write dissertations in their own native language? That's a great question. And I would say absolutely it's transferable. Because what we did is really what I did, at least with the students and what my tutors did, is a lot of what we call talk aloud strategy. So rather than them writing, we would talk about what they wanted to write. What is it that you want to convey to your audience? What do you want your audience to take away from this? And by talking about it, then they're, they're reducing the need to try to write first in Spanish and then translate to English. And instead what they're doing is they're thinking only in English as they're speaking in English about what they want to say. And then they put that on paper. And then what we did from there is we used a tool called Grammarly, which I highly recommend. And then that actually helped them a lot with the grammar of the sentences. It gives you, as you type, it shows all of the different grammar mistakes, commas that you've missed. So they already did the pre-writing phase. And so actually when they went to go write what they wanted to say, they had that tool to help them and assist them throughout the way. And then they could meet with a tutor again that then would have another set of eyes on it to make sure that they were actually conveying that message. And because that tutor already knew what message they wanted to convey, that made the whole process a lot easier. 
That's great. So that, I mean, in, in that sense, here in Puerto Rico, we, we have a, at least a tool that we can also use to help our students write their disserta dissertations in Spanish as well as in English. Dr. Montalvo, do we have any other questions? Uh, no, but I'm here to ready to uh, do the questions in the chat. If you are able to write your questions in the chat, uh, please do so, so I can definitely uh, read these questions. So um, we can definitely uh, share this with the panel. But I see someone on the audience that have a question, Mauricio. You're welcome, because you know my name. Thank you. Um, this is a question for uh, Dr. Youth Dr. and also for um, Jeanette, and that has to do specifically with me also being Latino. I know that halfway through high school when I moved to the U.S., I pretty much lost access to my mom because she didn't speak um, English. And so I couldn't come home and say, can you help me with homework? Can you help me with this, right? Um, and my question is, as a father of three daughters, I want to be very involved, right, in their, in their education. Are any of your projects also considering or thinking about what can be done with parents? I know that the focus is we help students, you know, um, I'm sorry, you're helping students with uh, writing dissertations, but sometimes it comes to a point where the students with parents who are not involved either because of the language or other things, um, there is a sense of separation and anxiety that also occurs. So are there any of any ideas, any possible ideas of working on some of these projects, for example, Jeanette, doing your classes in Spanish so that the students can take it to the parents and say, hey, mom, did you know about this? And can you help me or dad? Um, you know, Dr. Jutes, you know, with regards to writing, um, any support that can be done so that parents know the struggles that the kids are going through, right? Instead of coming home and being stressed out and feeling that there's no support, is there anything, any plans in the future perhaps of doing things either in Spanish or in other languages uh, to help parents get back to being supportive to their kids? Um, so that's kind of like question, comments, slash. Should I go first? <laughs> so for my project, a uh, second phase is once I have my audience, once I have that, the students, is also talk to the parents in their native language, hopefully Spanish. <laughs> so that's my target audience, but I, I'm for every underrepresented minority. But yes, definitely talk to the parents because I did not have that. So I understand how even till this day, my dad is now 78 and he's still has maybe five words that he can say, say in English. So I definitely think that it's important. Second part of second phase is to reach out to the parents and design something short and simple for them to also participate in the process. Parents are involved in, 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 uh, in their education. It's just that that barrier, the language barrier can be mm -hmm. an issue. Dr. Juice, the question for you is, is it possible for um, your project to integrate parents even when working with graduate students? I definitely think it's possible, even though it's not something I have directly thought about. I can say through Zoom, I have communicated with several students, significant others, parents, sometimes children, because people come into the room, they are helping them with Zoom. Um, but the great thing about our university is that we are very comprehensive. If a student has a problem, we have an army of people that are there to help. So I definitely think that's something that um, if a student needed, or maybe we could even implement into a curriculum in the future, that our university would be open to, to having some sort of curriculum for the parents as well. Great. Um, as a matter of fact, there is, there is research that, that has shown that the integration of community parents and other stakeholders in the process of learning language is, is greatly beneficial for students who are in the process of not only um, um, learning the, the vocabulary, but also writing and, and, and getting to share with, with other people. So uh, I have no doubts that making sure that we integrate other people in addition to the person who is in the, in the center of the process will be beneficial. And we do have another question um, here in the mic. I can hear you. I'm not sure if everybody can hear. Uh, guys, volume? Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's turned on. It's the volume, I guess. 
No, talk, talk again to see if. Mm, nope. The, the technical, no, he's coming. Don't worry. We are live, remember. Anyway, I'm putting on the chat that, that you still have a few minutes to do questions. So please write it either in English or Spanish on the chat. If not, okay, fine. Let's do some work to the <laughs> microphone that is on. Go ahead. Yes, this is on. Um, thank you for that question that just came up involving the parents into the student's education. As you know, at the elementary level, parents are usually involved. In the middle school and high school, they are generally deterred to be involved. <laughs> and the university level, Nobody cares, right? We never really involve the parents. But we have a, a, a national science funded project that we just started a, like six months ago, which we calling it family centered pedagogy. So what we are trying to do is we have already a community engaged scholarship and learning program, formal program at UTRGV. But this project is to focus on bringing families it may not be of the student's own family, but from the community into the classroom in STEM courses that are introductory courses where faculty member gets trained in this and they create a project with the students and the family leaders, a locally culturally relevant small project that applies the subject matter into the project. And then that project students conduct, and then the parents or the family members come in and comment on it. And then at the end, the students project those uh, to the class. So this project is an institutional transformation project for us. It will run for five years. And over time, we will be sharing the data on, on this. Yeah. Hopefully you'll be here and, and you can share it with yeah. us because that yes. sounds really, yes. really interesting. Yeah. Yeah, um, and it, it actually goes to show that uh, learning a language is not just about the, the techniques and the technicalities of the language. There is a lot of culture involved. And, and when we're dealing with different language learners, we want to make sure that we consider the cultures of these language learners and integrate these cultures. There are many of our cultures, as a matter of fact, Hispanics, we're, we're very close, closely related. There's a tight knit with, with our family and how the family involves and, and engages in the processes of learning um, is there. And of course, there's, there's some difficulties when our, our mothers and fathers can't go to the schools and speak to our teachers because they don't know the language. They can't approach these teachers. And sometimes the same students are the translators. Uh, we, we're, you know, we're not even sure they're translating exactly what the what mom wants, I mean, what the teacher wants mom to know, but they're, they're actually translating for our parents. So being able to do this at the college level um, when, when it seems maybe quote unquote irrelevant because we're adults, it's actually beneficial and necessary for many of us. Dr. Montalvo, any questions in the, in the chat? No, I just put that we are closing the, clo uh, the Q&A session because we are running out of time. Uh, we have attended some concurrent sessions. So we are ready to conclude. And your final remarks, our NC will do the final remarks as well. Well, my final remarks are very simple. There's a lot to do. There's a lot of work for us. And that's good because that, that means that uh, there's a lot of research that we can engage in. There's a lot of, of work that we can get involved with. And um, looking at how we can use technology to facilitate our job is certainly promising. Um, and having great panelists uh, looking at these as important topics is also very inspiring. I'm sure that you were also inspired and are looking forward to see the results of these studies and other studies in the future, such as our, our colleagues here. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for, for participating and listening. And I'm sure that we'll have other very interesting presentations during the day today. So enjoy. Thank you. Thanks to, thanks to all panel members for your extraordinary presentations. Uh, your commitment to the Hispanic community and the improvement of education are truly inspirational. And welcome to the stage. I want to welcome to the stage Dr. Yuberki Montalvo to recognize the 2022 Best Practices Showcase track winners.
Yes, of course. Uh, since we have some virtual, you will receive your certificates uh, saying that you are a, track, a winner by email, but the ones we have face-to-face, -face, we want to take some pictures and recognize, first of all, uh, Francisco Garcia for receiving the highest score in the category of best practices in promoting innovate innovative practices that strategically use technology to support, drive, and optimize online courses or programs and promote effective development and design. And also, we would like to congratulate Janet Flores for receiving the highest score in the category of best practices and innovative projects that focus on increasing Hispanic access to higher education. So thank you both for this and the ones virtually, you will be next week receiving your certificates online by mail, excuse me. So with this presentation and discussion, we officially conclude the plenary sessions of the 2022 Heads of Ex-Practices Showcase. We invite you to participate in the rest of the concurrent sessions we have today. Before we conclude the session, we would like to share some important news and instructions. We want to point out that there is a simultaneous translation available for the Spanish presentations. Headsets are available at Hall A, where the Spanish presentations will be held. For those participants connected virtually, an icon of interpretation will be at the bottom of the virtual room to select the language of your preference. For the English presentations, the closed captions feature is available in English. Also, all the presentations are being recorded and will be uploaded at the HEADS website during the following weeks. An email will be sent to all participants who invite you to visit HEADS.org to access all videos. You are encouraged to share them among your colleagues. If you are interested in receiving a continuing education certificate for this event with a 12 contact hours for a fee of $15, make sure you access the form at the registration area. For those connected virtually, look for the link included in email sent with the conference program to request a continuing education certificate. For the in-person participants, have your lanyard visible at all times to facilitate access to all presentations, lunches, and coffee breaks. Do not hesitate to stop by the registration area or ask the head staff if you have any questions or doubts about this event. Finally, thank you for accepting HEADS invitation to participate in its 2022 Best Practices Showcase. We hope you can benefit tremendously from the resources and the networking opportunities available. Finally, we would like to invite you this afternoon to join us in a very special reception to celebrate the success of this event and network with colleagues from different heads of memory institutions from Puerto Rico, the United States, and Colombia. This reception will be taking place at the lobby area outside the theater. We will have refreshments and music performance that we hope you enjoy. We expect you to see you in the 2024 for the next Heads of Ex Practices Showcase. Thank you. Muchas gracias. Good job. I just love the presentation. Buen trabajo. Francis.